Good evening. Uganda is amongst the countries afflicted by patriarchy, a social system which places women as subordinate to men. In coveted roles like political leadership, moral authority, social privilege, and property, men are dominant. Some patriarchal societies are also patrilineal, meaning that property and title are inherited by the male lineage. Many believe that this fuels gender-based violence. So on the spot night, to discuss this topic is a panel of three, including Tina Musuya, the Executive Director, Center for Domestic Violence Prevention, Godiva Akulo, the Deputy Executive Director, Chapter 4, and Joseph Kabuleta, a senior pastor at Watchmen Ministries. But before we do that, I have my producer is telling me we have to cross to Ginger Municipality, where right now the Electoral Commission is declaring the results of who has carried the day in the Ginger Municipality by election. Let me go to Ginger now. Marked in favor of Mr. Nabeka. Because it is important that he gets to the root of that. Because the source of that ballot paper must be investigated. That ballot paper had the, the proper sequence of the names as they appeared on the ballot paper we used. And the symbols were meaning that this was an inside job by the Electoral Commission. So having said that, I want to say that praise and glory be to the Lord. But I want to thank my team, headed by Honorable Ibrahim Samujunganda, deputized by Mr. Sam Rubega, and the chief, my chief campaigner, Mr. Francis Kasagira, you did a good job. I want to thank the voters. The trust you put in me, actually, has made me get indebted to you, the people, because you left the money, you persevered the intimidation, you persevered the reins to go and choose the leader you want. That shows that actually you have taken back your power and to the country where this was a big test to all of us because it was going to look like a reward for those who are men who raped our constitution. But now that the people of Ginger spoke, it meant a lot to this country. And I want to, to say to the people of Ginger Municipality East Constituency that thank you, thank you, thank you so much. May the God reward you. you. Nendo kutu alo mkisagu na ukoba ante chiti wa naitendo Birire mwaka makatonda Atusobo zisiza ukutu wa kubu wangu zivone Nenda kutengeze yu wanga Ntituwa atandika akalulu kanu Nga bana ifeba ine obululu yanku mibili Mbubali bataire kufota register So chitegeza Tinaire balanza akalulu nga tusingano obululu yanku minaluka hana In the actual sense Tusingano obululu yanku misa tunaluka hana Because the 2000 divorce him Bubata ku fake on the on the voter register. But the Mokubu to Laku Babuleka, that's the starting point. A choku video. Until Avantu Balazi, until Sokuba Nisente, Sokuba Nemundu, Sokuba Nabulichim, ITV Gula Mitu Maja Avantu. Era Nenda Kuebaza, Avantu Bajinja Municipality East Constituency. Until Balazi sent to Sola Gula Mitu Maja. Era Chakuba Neraku, Eri Omute Nena, Kuan Nadan, Mbai and Dukuvania, Nacho Kavio Kuronda. Now, Uganda police, ever headed by this criminal, RPC, Wawano, Abarabantu Bange, now Ghana never have ever seen Bio. H. H. Barenga by Zibu Waman, who went to get a roll while later. That criminal RPC, I know over 500 people, the police said, Vagam, Yokovagam office, Yang, Nibagam, and the Vegas, about to lock police station. So, no way, so Mozaka man. Ukubidomala, I catch your cabio colon. To Wabayo, to Gambia and Gobulu. Over the politics, the government of Makenga, who government in favour of one candidate, Mwami Naveta, the government of Kobani, Yaiva, the rango we be able to hire mice. Mbaya the Subia chairman walked to Kebio Kulon. Oko gera kubu ibi obo ngaba baba ireo. Era yeche nene doku mwe baza. Bemba ireo kumasa sako primary school. Nibaya gula box. Nitu agana mo bulu bulu marketing favour of Mwami Naveta. Tubuto ireo mutu akwa bulu bulu notebook gema na bulu fan abuti. Sio numbers demu atua, tidi imashinga ni dino. Mwenye yako anti chitofu, zaina bankobi mbote geiri. Yako ndiye tubote kumbali, bube mu official report as fake ballot papers. Nafana ni copy ya report yeye. So msaaba, ngapo bankobi yenta jia taking action kuchino. Msaaba anti wa yendo kulongo sana yacho, yacho kicho kebio kulonda. Ave ya tu kovu nta, bantu abe ni gidemu mubi kolo ebi. Ebi o printinga fake ballot papers, ba kanga ivulo ruen songa. Ballot paper ebi fake, ebi na all the futures ngapo ballot paper. Eneva ireo chikulaga, unti sa sana inside the job, muri mugua muda moto commissioni. Ero le yafu na plate, yajua these fake people, ba kola they are fraud. Ngaba kuzeti, ngaba chigeni ndeere. So nalo ensonge yuko, 
Nenda maliriza nga nebaza abantu abajinja isi. Nti mweziza mweliza obuyinza bwaimwe. Nzira chensobo la kuba sima, chensobo la kuba wa. Musobo ilo okugumila okuti isi watisi wa. Mwagumi wa okukubwa. Mwagumi wa amadi. Mwasala okwe ilizobo. Zira chisa mbele wa ilara. Nenda kusala wa okube baza. Jiti muswaziza Uganda. Eba ile tuli ingiride. Afta abantu kukema kosho ya fembele baji gema. Okuba sasulamu. Mwabose mwagire viko levi yako la konsu ni yefi. Mwabwe na kumpuliza. Ni mwabwe maulide. Nenda kube baza. Ni musimu ye muli. Mwakoze a very big coverage. The Honorable Paul Muir there, member of FDC, I think he's giving his victory speech in Ginger after clinching that seat of uh, Ginger Municipality East in a by-election that was hot, hot, uh, was contested. Uh, it was very combusted by Marseille. And we say congratulations to Paul Muiru. Uh, I hope the Honorable Nabit will be able to say, to also congratulate uh, Muiru so that we advance uh, our democratic values as a country and the people of Ginger Municipality East. Congratulations too, because it appears this went um, with the minor hitches here and there. And that is a move forward. We are going into our discussion tonight which is into looking at why do we find ourselves as a country with a lot of gender-based violence. If you go in areas of Gulu, of Busoga, but across all over Uganda, the woman is looked upon down. The woman is trumped upon. The woman is tilling the land she does not own, perhaps sometimes even has no authority over the products that are produced on that land. So let me, before I even introduce once again my panel, I want to take you back to the Honorable Twinamasiko Onasmas. The words he spoke, even though he apologized, I suppose he represents a group of people who not only talk such, but do exactly what he said. Are the ones who beat women. Why do you beat women? Why don't you, if you want to fight, why, why don't you look for fellow men and you fight? It is, uh, they call it in English, uh, being a bully. Being a bully. Why do you beat somebody who is weak? As a man, you need to discipline your wife. You need to, you know, touch her a bit and you tuck her hand, you beat her somehow, you know, to really streamline her. Honorable Onesimus Tunemasiko there, and before that we had the president himself speak against gender-based violence, and Tunemasiko was saying it's okay. In fact, the words he said were, as a man, you need to discipline your wife, you need to touch her a little bit, you tackle her, beat her somehow, to really streamline her. And that caused an uproar in the country. I suppose positive anger. Let me introduce once again my, my panel. I have the Executive Director Center for Domestic Violence Prevention, Stina Musuya. Welcome once again. Thank you. I have Godiva Akulo, Deputy Executive Director, Chapter 4. And I have Pastor Joseph Cavaleta from the Watchman Ministry. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And let me... What do you make? I know the Honorable Onesimus apologized. But his words, he could have apologized because of the spotlight and the pressure that was put on him. I can imagine anywhere in this country, in a remote corner, in a remote village, the words are actually being actualized today, tonight. How can this be stopped, Joseph? Well, um, it's it, it, it's, it's a cultural thing, and it's not going to be stopped overnight, that's for sure. And as you said, uh, he apologized because he was caught. He broke the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. But the truth is, uh, the views that he expressed are common views. And uh, a majority of the people who carry out those views do not even express them. Now, he's guilty because he verbalized them. And not so much because he does. You might find he doesn't even um, uh, necessarily practice. But the point is, it's a cultural issue, which has to be tackled over a period of time. And um, uh, I, I suppose making it part of a debate such as this is one of the steps to make people and uh, men understand that um, they can be men in the homes without any use of violence. Uh, good, good diva. Uh, mm -hmm. Am I getting it right? Mm -hmm. How deep can we burrow into? our cultures and, and, and get out some of those negative aspects that take women back without necessarily looking <laughs> like we are even destroying our own culture. Yes, I, but here's the thing. I don't think that we can destroy culture yeah, because culture is how we live our lives, mm. yeah, how we organize ourselves as a society, which means that when we discover that there are certain things that are not working for all of us, then we can adjust them. That's part of us creating culture. 
And I think that for the longest time, people who have been advocating for the rights of women, yeah, and for inclusion of women in society, are actually giving us what we need to do to change this thing. When we say that we want to see more women seated on panels on shows such as this one, it means that we want people to see that women are capable of speaking for themselves, yeah? That goes a long way towards removing that idea, because when Onesma says that, he, he presumes that women are not human beings, yeah? Women exist for men to discipline, that you can discipline a woman, which is usually a that we use for people whom we feel we have power over, like children, prisoners, you understand? So for an adult person to be disciplined by their husband, yeah, for a woman to be beaten, that means that there's this expectation that this person is not equal to me. This person is not the same as me. So I can treat them in this way. So I think that we can, there are things that we can do every day to rehumanize women to our society. And one of the things that we can do in that way is to Portray women as human beings, portray women doing work, yeah? portray women doing things other than just the things that we assume women should be doing. Do you sometimes, you know? Tina, feel like and the women activists, perhaps you are even swimming against the current? I'm saying this because look in the United States, the case of Harvey Weinstein, who is a, a big movie maker in, in, in California. And, you know, women have suffered under his leadership or... But they kept quiet until this year or last year when they started the Me Too campaign. And not everybody is coming out. And yet these are women of substance, women in, with great uh, audiences and, and stages. But they were there suffering in silence until maybe something had to come up. And then everybody, we saw the whole of Los Angeles and New York and everybody in, in big position saying, even Me Too, I have suffered. What causes women, even in big places, to to suffer in silence. Oh, well, sorry, but yes. uh, it included men as well. Um, that Hollywood scandal included yes. homosexuals yes. who had abused women, just as uh, men, mm. uh, just as much as men, as women rather. But also and um, of course, there was a lot of women uh, uh, naturally, but uh, there were people like Kevin Spacey, who's um, there's a whole trade of boys whose lives he destroyed. Out Joseph, of abuse. Can, we, can we talk so, about women? Yes, yes. No, my point <laughs> yeah. is, can we talk my about women? Uh, yes, we are actually <laughs> going to talk about women. Mm. I, I didn't bring that in the spirit of also us not talking about. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I was just bringing yeah, that out. Yeah, yeah, Tina. Why yeah. would a woman of substance, a woman mm. of valor, mm. a woman with power who commands a global audience, mm. suffer in silence for so long? Um, picking on what Godiva said, mm. it's all coming from how entrenched the patriarchal system is like and some of the very many norms that sustain that whole hierarchy of power are uh, the, the male hierarchy and privilege that really keeps very many women subdued and it all rides on silence because often do you know what happens when a woman is abused many times mm -hmm. people just blame when she speaks out so fear of shame mm -hmm. blame and the unsupportive environment because when it, it often comes to issues of sexual violence, do you know what happens when a woman is abused? Instead of people vying for the person who has abused, they're like, oh, how was she dressed? What time was it? Was she throwing herself at this person? So the blame has been always on the victims. Mm -hmm. We need to redefine the narrative. We need to make people understand Abuse is abuse, no matter what. We need people to know that women, just like Godiva was saying, and girls have equal value and worth. So when we are raising children, boys, girls, we need to help them know that each one of them is of equal worth and value. And the boys don't have a right to abuse girls. Neither do the girls have a right to abuse. So we need to make it really, really, um, we need to make the environment supportive for people who have been abused to come up and speak. And that's why when it comes to the example of the MP who said those shameful things, mm -hmm. I was very happy to see that the burden was not on us who are often the victims, women, but the entire country stood up and said, no, this we cannot have. So the burden shouldn't be pushed to the victims. It, uh, all of us are responsible for creating a safe environment. And each one of us must speak out and condemn such actions, whether they are done in, in secrecy, mm -hmm. 
or when we get to hear about them, let us listen and believe. And, uh, you know, let's be objective rather than starting to blame the victims. Uh, uh, Joseph, considering the utterances of Onesimus uh, Twinamasiko, the member of parliament, the words he uttered and the anger it, that created and how Ugandans reacted, does it, it show that Ugandans are evolving and maybe we are more gender sensitive and perhaps we shall get there? No, we will get there. We will get there. There is no doubt about that because... Um, the, a lot of strides have been made uh, in regard to uh, people seeing women as well capable of doing anything that a man can do um, intellectually and in every other sphere. But the point I was trying to make earlier on is there is that thing of privilege. When somebody is in a position of privilege, it could be um, a lecturer or a student and somehow uh, the lecturer has a lot of power or husband and wife, uh, it, uh, or even like in the case the, you've heard of the American doctor of the Olympic team, yes. gymnastics team, who um, molested as many as 130, 147 girls, um, uh, perhaps more than that. Those are the ones that came out and has been sentenced to something close to 170 years in prison. Now, the thing is, the act, as she said, of them coming out, one person stands out, because if none of them had stood out, that man was going to get out with it. And you'd probably still be doing that right now. But one person comes out and says that this happened to me. Then others are emboldened. And then they come out and they come out. And the way the whole thing was handled, um, uh, perhaps will empower other people to come out in future if um, there is somebody who is abusing their privilege. But positions of privilege will always be there, which is the position, what I was trying to say even with um, the thing of uh, the, uh, that whole Hollywood scandal. It affects when somebody doesn't know how to handle positions of privilege, uh, it, of any power. Because at any one time, somebody will be in power over other people. I have the power to promote you. I have the power to appoint you, to disappoint you. I have the power to pass your feet. I have the power to put you on the football team or not on the football team mm -hmm. and all such things. So at the end of it, you have to appeal to the good nature of society and the goodness in somebody. Because Kamara is going to be in positions of authority. There's going to be a woman who is going to come and perhaps you have the ability to sign her appointment letter. Now, are you going to behave honorably or are you going to um, perhaps look at her as desperate, she needs this job, and see that as an opportunity for yourself? So, the only person that can answer that is Kamara. Okay? So, now, good, how do you tackle an equal power relation mm -hmm. in, in a village? There's always somebody who, in most cases, it's men. They have the jobs, they have the titles, and there are all these young ladies. Perhaps you want a job, perhaps you want some help. And the person who can help you, he can abuse that position of power. There's always an equal power relation. How do you bring, how do you remove that? I think that we remove it, like he, he said, we have a long way to go, yeah? But mm. I think that one person speaking out often is is the first step to creating a snowball effect where other people start to speak out, which is why, and you kept referring to, to examples from Hollywood, yeah? Mm. And I, think, I don't think we even need to go that far to find those examples. Mm. Remember just last year, um, Mr. Muchiri, the late, who was the owner of the St. Lawrence Schools, mm. the scandal that happened after he died, you know, all these people coming up and saying, where did all these children come from? Or recently this incident that has been happening with the headmaster, I think, in Chibuli, yeah? These things are happening and we see them happening because if somebody is abusing students for years, there's a network, teachers know, other students know, then the silence, like Tina said, yeah, mm. that these things thrive in silence. So I think that one, we need to encourage women to speak out, but we also need to encourage men to speak out. For example, when your neighbor is beating his wife, everybody hears. But it's in very rare cases that somebody will go and knock at night and say, but really, we've had this noise, like there's a drum in this house, like, can we have a conversation about this? I think that we need to be more invested, yeah, in each other's welfare. We can't continue to, and a lot of men do this thing where when they have daughters and they say, now I understand, you know, what women are going through. I think that we as a society must take interest and listen to what women have, saying, have been saying because women have been shouting about this pain for a very long time. When Kazibe was getting divorced from her husband and they reported in newspapers that he used to slap her, the reaction wasn't, how can this engineer slap this woman? It was, hey, even Kazibe, a vice president, can be slapped. So all you women, you better watch out. Yeah? So I think that there needs to be more empathy, first of all, in the engagement with the issue of gender-based violence. I, what I don't understand, you know? in most men, I think, mm -hmm. if you tell them, if you touch their sister, 
they will kill you. If you touch their mother, you'll have it rough. If you touch their daughter, you'll have it rough. But if you, t but I mean, but when they talk about the wife, somehow they're like, they're the same people. So it's how do we change the conversation so that we just don't talk about the wife? Say, I mean, you know what I mean? That don't touch my daughter, don't touch my mom, don't touch my sister. So if people understand it that way, then eventually no one will touch their wives. Mm -hmm. So several things need to happen because when you look at the narrative as it is right now, it has quite a number of, when you look at wife, husband, it has connotations around power mm -hmm. and dominance. That's why you hear people saying, who is wearing the pants in this relationship? It's alluding to the power mm. and control that one has to have. So we need to make everyone understand that when people come into a union of whatever form, it's about partnership. And partnership means equity, respect. No one has to be ahead. You have to make joint decisions because you're heading what? Is this an empire? It's not a business venture. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship. Yeah. It's a partnership. So not until people move to that level of understanding that a partnership has issues of equity, fairness, respect, mutual respect. That's what people need to understand. Because but often people, uh, when you get into a relationship, with the man, he thinks he must start making decisions for you mm. and controlling your life because they think that's what it means to be a man. So men and even the women themselves, because this is like a system, need to understand that there's no good in taking a subordinate position. There's no good in taking a dominant position. We need to be more equitable. That's mm. what is more helpful. Do you know what you're up against? The reality is that if you decided to buy uh, Joseph Cavalete a cup of coffee tonight mm -hmm. and took, take, took him to a cafe, and, and perhaps assuming he has no money and you are the one who's bailing up tonight, and after that coffee, that waiter waitress is going to take the bill to Joseph Cavalete, mm -hmm. assuming that Tina has no money. Yet you are the one who has driven him there, and if you are the one who was even going to, to, even to pay the salary. Because society thinks that way. Mm -hmm. The bill will go to Joseph and not to you. Even you are the one who's supposed to be paying. That's what this other thing No, but I, I don't necessarily see that as a problem. Because um, you say to yourself, if you touch somebody's mother, the wife, or the daughter, that you, you, you know you get the rough end of them. That's because as a man, protection comes naturally for the women you love. So if you are in love with any woman, a daughter, a mother, or a wife, you automatically feel you, you have a right to protect that person. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, the other thing that comes naturally, of course, now society has turned it upside down, and that's not right, is provision. Okay? Uh, as a man, I would not feel good if I wasn't providing for my family. That doesn't mean my wife doesn't earn her money and what, but I would want to be the one providing because I feel that is... Um, it, it actually comes naturally. It's not one of the mm -hmm. things that somebody has to tell you, provide for your family, uh, provide, make sure that, you know, your family is all taken care of. Now, a man who does not do that is, um, well, even, I mean, not even, in, uh, the far as the Bible is concerned, it says actually is, has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel uh, if you do not provide for your family. So those are things that come naturally. Now, if in this case, it's the woman who has the money and the uh, waiter brings the bill to me, I'll push it. Uh, to the lady and no problem but i hope next time i'm the one actually who is paying the bill mm. uh, only this time i didn't have the money but um f concerning what she's saying in regard to uh, i cannot i i don't give you the what the bible says because that's my um, uh, jurisdiction about relationships in marriages now the bible says um uh, a husband is the head of the home okay that does not mean a woman is the head a man is the head of a woman, it only means husband is the head of a home. In other words, the husband is the head, you know, in the home. In other words, um, you and her are the same in, in the Bible. But if you got married, then now you are her head, as far as this Bible is concerned. Now, outside of marriage, it, you're all equal. But in marriage, for the sake of that relationship... Mm, I would like to interrupt. Oh, no, no, I'm second just, second. Let, let me just explain that. For mm. the sake of that relationship, there is one person who is given the leadership role. 
and um, it is not to load it over. Mm. It's all written in there. It's not to load it over. Actually, it gives specifications of how that person is supposed to lead and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And violence and disciplining and touching a bit and all those things are not acceptable. But the headship belongs to the man as far as... But submissiveness know. is acceptable. <laughs> he, um, yes, it is, actually. That's what the Bible says. That you should and, be submissive. Uh, yes, and, um, but it puts the onus first on the man. And it says, love your wife the way Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Now, I will tell you this. If a woman in a relationship like that sees a man who is ready to give his life for her, I, try, I can guarantee you submission will not be a problem because she knows her interests are well taken care of in this arrangement. Now, the trouble is it has been abused. And then women turned into what they thought they had to become, and perhaps they, they had to become that. But the way it is prescribed is extremely workable, and it serves both interests. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Godiva, do, mm -hmm. Godiva, do you have an issue with a, yes, an element of submissiveness? Mm -hmm. I want to reject everything that Patrick is saying. Mm -hmm. Sorry, well, Joseph, myself, sorry Joseph. Joseph. Mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. saying, actually, because mm -hmm. I think that what you're doing is you're using religion as a tool to now reinforce your patriarchal ideals. Mm. This, and then you, you're, you're calling it normal. It's natural for a man to want to provide. Mm. And that's what we mean when we talk about how patriarchy then plays up power in relationships. Yeah. Mm. So what happens when you tell a man that he has to provide for his family and if he doesn't provide, he's a weak man, he's not a man? This means that this man obviously feels disempowered when he's unable to provide and yet this man who is unable to provide is still like he said the head of the home mm -hmm. which means he must exercise power in that home so how does he exercise that power mm -hmm. he beats up everybody around no, no, him that's, no, 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 that's no, no, abusing yeah? the power that's, that's not that, that's not what i said and that's not even no, what the bible says the thing is that you're not listening to what i'm saying i'm mm. drawing a correlation and mm. making conclusions from what you said mm. yeah and what he's doing is he's describing the essence of patriarchy this thing that gives this power to men, yeah, and creates expectations for them and expectations for women as regards behavior. Because mm. not all men can provide, you understand? Mm. Not all men can provide, not all women can submit, or mm. not all women submit, not all women are comfortable with that kind of grading in relationships. Mm. So that means that when men have the presumption that they must have power in a relationship, they will take it. And if you refuse to give them that power, that's when you get beaten, yeah? So this question, does patriarchy, is patriarchy to blame for gender-based violence? The answer is emphatically yes. And now another thing, because from listening to what Joseph was saying, I thought about another way in which I think that we as a Ugandan society can start to challenge patriarchy and, you know? I attended a Kwanjula recently and I was really shocked at the things that people say to women when they're getting married, you know? People tell tell women she's going to be a good wife, we raised her well, she's nurturing, she's caring, she won't give you any trouble, yeah? How about if when we were giving our daughters away to men, yeah, we had a conversation about their dignity, that on Kwanjula, when you're the father of the bride who has been called to, to speak, you remind these people who have come to take away your child that in this home we've treated her like a human being. And so where you're taking her, we expect her to be treated just that well. And if it is not done, you will have problems with this family. Those are simple things that we can do to protect our daughters every day, our children. And we're not even attempting to but do it. Perhaps you have because missed it because in, no, in my culture where I come conclude. from. Mm, let, let me just conclude. Let me tell you. Because we are, we are so invested yeah, in the protection of this religious ideal. This religion, which who brought this religion to us to tell us that, you know, the man is your head. And then because of that, then we justify, you know, oppressing people who live among us every day. I don't think that we can justify the way that women get treated in relationships. Sometimes, good but, some, sometimes uh, if, uh, you had, if you had actually taken care to understand what I said and not um, want to, this is not about power and what. This is about two people being together. Uh, it has nothing to do with power. Ah. And it so has nothing to do with... Uh, no. Now, this is a relationship. And in every relationship, where I work, I have a boss. Okay? It, it's, it doesn't mean that he treats me not as a human being. But I know that for this company to work, there has to be somebody at the top, there has to be somebody, else, and that's how it works. Every, wait, wait, wait. The, the examples you give. No, let me give, let, let, let me give you an example. Because mm -hmm. there's women at the workplace, then there's women at home. And these are different prescriptions, okay? Um, a woman in a relationship or in a marriage 
is um, for that marriage to work, there is a prescription that I gave her that's from the Bible and has nothing to do with putting her down and all that. There is nowhere where that is uh, condoned or even encouraged or even condoned. That is totally true. But of course, if you come from this position of, um, you know, who brought this religion and all that, then you're going to want to tear down everything without necessarily understanding it. But the thing is, uh, the reality is that I have seen scenarios where um, people have tried to work it in a different way. And then you pick it from the Western society and um, so you bring it here. And then you have to understand, before, before you, all this women activism and what. And by the way, my, I mean, my staff boys, when I was writing, sports writer, there was this coach, in um, athletics coach, who had impregnated four young girls who were below 18. And apparently he had some position of privilege, he was known to the DPC of the area, and all stuff like that. And we wrote about it until that guy eventually came to justice. First of all, as a sports journalist, because he was kidding careers of athletes, number one. Number two, because these were underage people, and what he was doing was playing against the law, and it's playing defilement now. And those are the things. Now, but then sometimes, and I tried, I remember that time I spoke to, in my anger, righteous fury, if you can call it so, I spoke, <laughs> to, I spoke to so many people whom I know to be women activists. And told them, Do you, are you aware of this coach in Capturo and what he's doing? None of them picked an interest. Why? Because it's, they, there's no funding from abroad and all that. They would rather pursue issues that are funded. Then there was a story in one of the newspapers, I remember, which okay. there was this, first wait, there was this lady, a young woman, who working in a factory, which makes mineral water, and they have to work at night. She was raped by four Indian men and fired. She ran to those activists and nothing happened. And actually, as um, almost, like out of my anger, I have never drunk that mineral water because of that incident. So you're talking Which about somebody. I don't want to mention it here because it might be against the rules, but I will tell you off air. Now, I cannot <laughs> drink it even if it's the only water. Now, because I, I said, how unjust, unjust can this be? They got her at night. She was alone on a night shift. They put, called her to an officer. And now I try to rouse certain activists to bring those Indians to justice. Because I remember one time... Bianima, Winnie Bianima, who is you know now in the UK, single-handedly brought Nairobi. okay, mm. single-handedly brought some Indian who had cremated his wife alive to serve years in prison for murder. She didn't. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, okay. I would like to interject. So, yes, but also please. Yeah, but I think, he's, he's, yeah, I he has introduced a, a point there mm. of women activists mm. who I need maybe not mm. not personally need for the not for the money for mm. the. Is that what you're trying to say? When, the, when there is a funding, they yeah. will go for that. Okay. I, 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 Sometimes. Think, <laughs> I, I think we really need to focus on issues mm. here. Yes. Mm. Because now when you start going off topic mm. around because there is no funding, we need to focus back here. The problem that we are trying to address, there's ma millions of women and girls being abused every other day. Mm. Now, when there are certain cases that come to light, mm. it calls for a lot of responsibility from all actors, mm -hmm. not only women, because the problem is affecting all of us. We should not think that because a woman has been abused, it's the responsibility of women alone. The justice system, how have we held them accountable? Because some of these things are way beyond us, women rights activists. Because if you find maybe my organization is not providing legal aid, we don't have that capacity. Mm -hmm and the, the particular case needs legal aid, and you go to me and I told you we can't do this, but we can facilitate this person to reach mm. the justice system. You need to know that we are going to work together mm. to help this person resolve that particular problem because these problems are not solved just in one day. We need to make the justice system work for all these people so that now we as a country now start to demand for more safety of whatever institutions that they are. Now, like, for example, the examples you brought around the sporting events in, um, I think, the mm. group that was in Captura. Mm. We as a country need to ask a bigger question. Right from the Ministry of Sports and Education, what mechanisms are in place? It's not only about the women rights activists. Certain very many things are not right. Or they were framed at that time 
when these crimes of gender-based violence were not realized as crimes. So we need to revamp the system, put up mechanisms in place, make it really useful for whoever has been abused to speak out. And even whoever is in working in a particular place needs to know the do's and don'ts. Okay, so we're talking about the justice system, mm -hmm. if, a, if a woman, for example, uh, reports a case of rape at the police and maybe uh, the, the case is taken to court, do you know what they go through? I mean, maybe some of you are even lawyers. Do you know what <laughs> they go through? The questions with the, they are asked mm -hmm. in public. If you cannot talk about sex in, even among two or three people, how is she going to even narrate about the story of how, how, how it started and how it ended and all that kind of stuff? Because I suppose... Lawyers like you should be actually thinking about establishing maybe special courts where such things can be handled because I don't see a child who has been defiled with 10 years starting narrating a story in a court, everybody. Maybe even the defiler is just in the court. Maybe even the defiler is a relative. Mm -hmm. Now, there are rules that handle things like that. For example, if you're taking witness testimony from children and how victims of, of sexual offences are treated, of course, originally, initially, it still continues to be a very toxic space, yeah, especially for women who speak out. But also, these NGOs that Joseph was talking about have been doing a lot of work, training people within the justice system, working with the justice law and order sector to give judges training on gender sensitivity, um, things of equality, and how to handle these cases in a way that is you know, sensitive. But then also, we cannot just leave the work to these activists like Tina was saying and also we cannot just leave the task to be done in only these you know centers of power because at the end of the day the people who the clerk at the court yeah has a family is part of this society yeah which means that if our society continues to blame women yeah a judge will continue to think that this is normal conduct that a lawyer can walk into a courtroom and ask a woman who was raped about the length of the dress that she was wearing you understand and so we normalize these things and then they cut across into our systems because we live in these societies this is not the first time that a leader in this country has said the things that Onesmas Twinamasiko said last was it last year it was I think in 2015 when Chibule said that women who are raped if they go to police and complain yeah the first thing police should do is ask them what they're wearing and if it's found that they were dressed indecently of course his description of indecently being something above the knees yeah then they should also be arrested that's a very victim blaming mentality a lot of women don't come out because they know the first thing they're going to be asked is what were you wearing what did you do to annoy this man who did this thing to you you understand so and when joseph says that we need to put Okay, not he says, he implies that the responsibility for looking after women who have been abused is on women. I think that we should add a corresponding responsibility yeah, for dealing with men who abuse and give that responsibility to men. Yeah, by the way, and yeah. I would gladly take that one, like I told you. But you know, sometimes you're looking for quorum because the person who is hurt, you're calling for somebody who is like them. Because you think, if this has touched me like this and I'm a man, Think about if I called a lady who understands what this is, because um, uh, perhaps I will never be in a position of somebody like that. So you're trying to gather quorum. Can you help me? I'm trying to bring this man down. How can he be? Because we had a case, I mean, one of the journalists went there and found two promising female athletes in his home cooking. We're talking about 16, 17 year olds. And these are people who, number one, are middle prospects for us. Number two, I shouldn't have no business being in a man's home cooking at that age. So I try to rouse some women. It's not that I think it's strictly their responsibility. But I was just trying to get some support. But I actually ran into a cold response. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm the one who is getting worked up about nothing. Because if, um, if Kamara went, let's say, if you were in a country which is majority white, and then there is a case of racism, who do you expect to respond first? Of course, the people who are affected by the incident. So I was expecting these people to take on this. I was giving them information, which I had, because I was in that field. They did where they are not. So the thing is, the honest truth is this. The, what is going to stop these things from happening is when there is fear of punishment. Now, when people do those things and get out with them, like that man did for so long, eventually he was brought to justice, though, then he gets the impression that it is going to be done. Now, it's going to be a while before girls and women come out and start saying you know i was raped it's going to be a while because now what was a personal problem 
um, eventually becomes a big problem. Then uh, you're thinking about uh, when I get to marriage age, is somebody going to want to marry somebody? Also, there are, there's all this stigma and um, all those things, which are a societal problem, a cultural problem, which have to be, you know, changed. However, the first thing that we can, uh, that the, the women themselves can do to go and empower those women to see themselves beyond the confinement of what they have been put into, because abuse of privilege is caused because the person who is being abused does not know that they can exist outside of what they have been confined into. You've, you know that uh, Steve Biko saying the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. That applies for this as well. So if the mind of the oppressed is turned around and she sees herself as, I can, um, I'm in this relationship with a purpose, I need something from this man, he needs something from me, we need each other. Now, if he starts behaving as if I'm a parasite, and then um, I can actually exist on my own. So that's the empowering that you should be talking okay. about. Jo Joseph mm. Godiva and mm. Tina, let's take a break and then we can continue with this discussion after the break. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guests tonight are Tina Musuya, Godiva Akulo, and uh, Pastor Joseph Kabuleta. We're discussing gender-based violence and how can we stop this vice in our society. I have seen uh, Tina with the other uh, women activists. You've started something that I've seen what you call shelter homes, sh shelter homes in Busoga, that when a woman is battered and their rights are violated and then they can run to that shelter home and so that they run away from a husband or whoever is disturbing them. But such things that you start, they can give maybe solace for that time. Are they sustainable? Um, we is that the way of changing society? We in, in, in the civil society yes. are doing very, very many things because if you have to make things change around positively, we must do so many things at the same time. Law enforcement is important. The shelters are important to give emergency support to the victims who have experienced violence. But again, we have to prevent the violence from happening. Mm. A lot of women's rights groups are doing a lot of work working with many, many communities across this country to change some of those norms. Mm. I wouldn't want to call it culture. Our culture is a big thing with so many nice things mm. in there. But within that, there are some norms that perpetuate, uh, you know, all this violence. Mm. So these civil societies are working to change some of those negative norms that are embedded within the belief system and the behaviors of these community members. I can give you an example. We are in very many communities where things are big, have really changed. It, we did one of our programs called SASA here in Kampala, and now we've scaled it up to Bosoga, Bosoga region, and now Queen and Moroto, and we were able to reduce physical violence by 52%. And this became a community, um, um, uh, the entire community pays attention to it, Men and women, children and, and everyone else are within this uh, particular effort to make sure that na they never keep quiet when they see violence. They still feel that men and women have to relate very equitably and know that if they have a problem, they need to talk mm -hmm. to someone. And then m someone was talking about how um, m m some young girls were raped in Kapchora and the society, I think, was just looking on. We need to turn that around so that the community stands with the victims. Because if they see it happen, they can even report on the behalf of the victims. They can even reach out to this person and say, what you're doing is not right. Mm -hmm. We can't accept that. Because sometimes some communities side with the perpetrators. They threaten the victim mm -hmm. and even clean away the evidence yeah. that even if you went to the justice system, there's no evidence. Or they make it particularly problematic because with threats, they're like, they're going to kill you or you will disappear. Mm -hmm. So we need a lot of efforts, concerted efforts. Everyone has a responsibility to do mm -hmm. something. Uh, uh, good, but is violence against women ingrained in our culture or because you seem to suggest that when you attended that function uh kwanjula you you thought yeah, at least somebody had, if you wished somebody had, could have given a pep talk to the man that please we are giving you this uh, but don't do abcd and i wanted to give you an example of my own culture where i come back i come from in toro they say we are giving you this i'm giving you my daughter with one name what that means that 
I don't want when she has reached your home to say uh, uh, Betty the one-eyed or Betty the one the one the one-legged or Betty you know because you have cut off the eye of you, you know but I'm giving you this girl my daughter with one name Namukoha Nibaralim meaning do not when she comes to your home you know injure her and then the society starts calling her do you remember the other one-eyed woman <laughs> so, so mm. the culture abhors violence against women mm. so I, I, I think Sometimes when you say it's a culture, maybe it's not true. Yeah, and, and, and that's what I've been trying to say, <laughs> you see, yeah, because there seems to be this implication that our culture exists to dominate and oppress women, and people will defend it in that way as culture. Even this, when this gentleman apologized in, in Parliament, some of those MPs were just, you know, there was a very jockey, you know, atmosphere around the things that he said, because a lot of them agree with the things that he said, yeah? yeah? Right. A lot of them think that the things that he said are normal and okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's because we've normalized, we've made it normal. In your but activism, have you met a woman mm. who thinks it's okay to be disciplined by a husband? Yes, husbands? yes, actually and more women. And can <laughs> I speak more to that? Yes, please. In a lot of our community work, yes. We had women say these things, and I took particular interest to ask them why they think that beating is a sign of love. Mm. Then these women say to me, but you see, when the man beats you, he will start to do so many nice things. He will apologize because, uh, unfortunately, mm. people think men don't apologize here in our community. Mm. He will apologize, then he will buy presents. Then he will spend more time with the woman, help even with the domestic chores because he's trying to make up. Mm. So for them, the beating is a bridge to the very beautiful parts mm. of a relationship, <laughs> which they are often Denied. not yeah, exactly. Mm. So we need to help men know that, you know, I hate it when people start saying women are emotional. Human beings are emotional. Mm. Unfortunately, here in this country, we've made it seem like the bad we've allowed men to express only the bad emotions mm -hmm. we need to make everyone know that men can express all those nice emotions at all times and they don't have to beat for them to to switch on the no, nice the real emotion. solution is going to come from men teaching men because they are always going to be in our, in our culture they are always going to be in a position of privilege because uh, especially in the rural areas it's going to be a while before um, we get to a place where um, perhaps uh, women um, earn or those things more than men. However, but if you equal. train uh, in other aspects, so however, if you train the men to understand, now from my experience, um, men who get violent do so because they do not understand women. So, uh, but also let's not get too drawn out. After all, the president was advising against domestic violence, that's a good step. So we have one man saying the right thing and he's the head of the nation, and another one is just one of 400 MPs saying the wrong thing. So let's just say it's not that. But the point is, it is going to have to be training of the man. Uh, the man to understand how women are, that women are different. Now, these are things which um, I myself have had issues with. You go through single-sex schools, and uh, you do not have encounters with women. Perhaps the first time you start having encounters, real encounters with women, you're seeing them uh, sexually. So at the time when you could have understood the differences between a man and a woman, you were in, uh, only among men. So when you get into a relationship, you meet this person and uh, you love her, but you kind of inwardly expect her to respond the way your male friends respond to certain things. And then she does not, because that's not how she's wired. She's a woman. She's not a man. Now, so I sat with my friends and I would say, I, I don't know what's wrong with men. I don't know what's wrong with men, women. And actually would echo that same thing. We don't know what's wrong with women. We don't know what's wrong with women. And it's like something is wrong with them. Then I went on a study and I discovered that the only thing that is wrong with women is that they are women. And there is nothing wrong because we, and we are judging because them by male so standards. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. no you are not understanding what I'm saying. No. We are judging women by male standards and naturally they fail. It's like judging um, fish by how they can fly. So when you understand who women are and you understand how to relate with them, domestic violence boils away because then what the woman does which is different, you see it as actually complimenting. What is, what is that understanding? The thing is to know that she's not like you and God made it that way 
because she's supposed to complement what you're not and you're supposed to complement what she is not so together you feel you know uh, you kind of fit in now if you expect a woman to behave like a man because all you've ever had through your raising was men you understand so you don't understand how you're, so you're born of a woman raised by a woman mm. no 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 but uh, that is your mother that's different but from it's a woman. no but the point different? is that peers now you see that's why when boys go to single sex schools actually they kind of tend to, or, or, i mean um single sex schools they kind of tend to have I'm t and i'm telling you something that has happened to me okay and that led to um a scenario in my life and that i learned a lot from okay and um I even put my writings in a book because I know that I made all those mistakes until I sat down and started to understand what is a woman, how different is she from me, and I actually went to a woman and I told her, why has this happened in my life? Why did I fail in my marriage? Why is this? So she starts telling me, these are the priorities that you should have taken care of, and in my set of priorities, which I thought I was doing well, when a woman gave me hers, the top seven, I was scoring almost maximum 10%. But what I thought were the top, I was doing well. But actually, in how world, they were the least important. So then I started putting these things together. And then I understand the complexities of how different they are from us and how that is not a problem. It is actually a solution. Then the violence goes away. So the, the, the solution to violence is in the man, training the man. You don't have to exert yourself using force. You don't have to exert yourself at all. This person is on your, there for you and you're there for her. And together, you, you cannot live a proper life without her. So you need her, she needs you. So in other words, uh, uh, Tina, the way how we groom our boys, how we groom our, our children is going to matter in having a generation that at least is free of gender-based violence. Yes, that's part of the solution. And for me, it shouldn't only stop at grooming from home, but also outside there, because as Godiva was saying, the tools that keep all this um, oppression is, uh, uh, alive is still everywhere. Look, when you go to school, there's a culture that makes it seem like I, uh, for my colleagues who went to mixed schools, me, I went to girls only schools, mm -hmm. where we were meant to believe that girls are as able mm -hmm. as the boys. Mm -hmm. For the ones who went to the mixed schools, I was told, mm -hmm. I don't know how true that is, that wh while they are there, the inferiority, you know, like, they grade. You girls, you can do this. No, oh, don't. This is not for you girls. Then the boys are put in leadership positions, you know, trying to script on their mind that boys are leaders, you are subordinates. So we need to change that within that uh, education system. And then even when we go to the workplace, when people see a man and a woman, they always assume that the man is the boss. And the woman is the one going to serve the tea and do the gender roles still in the public space. Mm -hmm. We need to change that kind of thing again. And that's where I think uh, as government, government needs to invest a lot in this particular issue of gender-based violence in terms of making sure that laws are implemented all services, when you look at the agricultural system, a lot of women are being oppressed. For us who work up country, you'll find, as Kamara was saying at the beginning of the show, a woman grows her crops, uh, the crops for the family, but she does not even own the harvest because the man who thinks he's the head of the family has the powers to sell off the harvest and go and drink the money away or marry other wives. The whole community is watching and saying, but it's his land, and he has decided. They are accepting that injustice. So when it comes to all sectors, we need to be doing many, many things to help them know that this violence is even hurting everyone. It's not only hurting women. We are keeping Good, What do you make of women in positions of leadership who have reached there using the, the affirmative uh, action uh, advantage and yet they seem some of them have stuck there for maybe 20 mm. years and some of them have not even tried to nurture or even help the woman <laughs> in the rural areas but they have just helped themselves um, 
Have they? I think have. that one, Museveni has stuck around for more than 30 years. Nobody so. is telling him to leave space for other so it's men. it's okay also for them to no, do I'm the not same? saying it's okay. Mm. I'm saying that women must be judged by the same standards as we judge everybody else. Yeah, There are MPs in that house who have been there since the parliament was called the Constituator uh, Assembly. Again, what are you trying to you say? You understand? Yes. No, <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that let us judge women by the same standards as we judge men. But mm. I'm also saying mm. that those Let's women are entitled. There's no term limit created for women in the Constitution for women MPs. MPs are allowed to run for as long as people are electing them. So the expectation that women MPs should be there for a certain period of time and then leave... I, I thought the whole idea was that you build your capacity, mm -hmm. at least one or two terms, and after that you can just go for adult suffrage and, and compete among us to men and other people also come on, so come on board. So you create this, uh, a critical mass of women who can change the country. But I, I, I think... <laughs> If we are to go in that space, mm -hmm. we need to have the same standards for the men and women yes. who are in that space so that they all have term limits and go away and create space for others. Mm -hmm. But if we think that the men can mm -hmm. stay as low per last, but women must exceed. No, I, and I thank I you, think, Tina, I because think I think that what you want, what, what, ju just I, to finish, I, ju I, just to... Mm. Just to pick off from what Tina is saying, mm -hmm. and this is what we are saying okay. about is changing. It was, it was, it was, it wasn't affirmative action mm. meant to create sort of capacity? Affirmative action was meant to cure the injustices mm. created by our history and our society, how we view women, how mm. we've treated women. Mm -hmm. That historically, women were not educated at the rates that men were educated. So the curing of, of the injustice is in perpetuity from in this one individual. No, it's not. But what we are saying is that the critique of affirmative action cannot be based on the behavior of particular women who have benefited uh -huh. from that system. That the critique of affirmative action must be about the ways in which it has failed to deliver what we said it should deliver, uh -huh. not about the behavior of Isn't these that individual women. Isn't what he's trying to ask, that perhaps it would have delivered more if after two terms somebody goes for adult suffrage. Now, you cannot put the same law on men because men all go for adult suffrage. There is no, um, you know, so... In other words, don't are we, we're not saying get out of parliament. I'm just trying to rephrase this question. We are saying now go and compete with men since you've had a kickstart of two terms. Let a young woman come and be the woman MP. Actually help her. Uh, help her to stand up so that that way perhaps you have 70% of the parliament women. Can I, rather than, you can know? I say that the attitude that informs that question, Patrick, mm. uh, is the same attitude that informs the assumption that women's issues must only be handled by women. Mm -hmm. You understand that the only people, why don't we ask these men MPs also just to correct you, mm. everyone is voted by universal adult suffrage including women MPs. Yeah, mm -hmm. Women MPs are voted by both men and women, they're not only voted by women. So. That attitude that expects that women's problems are unique, women's problems are not society's problems, you understand? And that's why we get siloed. That's why we shall complain about women not being included in conversations, and then they'll only call us to come and participate on a panel when we are talking about violence against women. And yet women, we can ably talk about other things as well that, not, that are not just things that affect women, you understand? Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the attitude behind that question is the same attitude that informs that kind of approach uh, to uh, the doing of women's <laughs> work. And so we should be very careful of it. Mr. Mm -hmm. Kamara, yeah? I, 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 I am a solution-based person. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that I know the problems of a male child. And I know that young children can be brought up to be taught how to treat women well, respectfully and with dignity. And I actually go out to do that. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, on Women's Day, I was in Jinja at a school teaching boys how to be people of character. And part of that is, you know, there are certain things you do as a person of character. And it, violence against anybody, especially not against women, I mean, especially against women, is not one of those things. And grooming them at an age where they are still impressionable. So that when they grow up, because that man, that boy there in a secondary school is going to be a husband, not too many years from now. So how he treats his wife will be based on what he's taught. Now, if, and, and I, I go to schools, actually, and that is my one thing. And it's all that character, this is what people of character do. This is how you treat women if you're a person of character. This is how you treat your wife. This is how you treat, you know, um, the people under your care, men or women. So that person is going to be a lecturer tomorrow. And if he's a person of character, he's not going to um, hound somebody out of good marks just because he wants a favor from them of a sexual nature and things like that. So... What I will do is practical. 
um, it will just be about going and changing people when they're at the impressionable age to make sure that they become better. Because if I, if I at that age had had somebody speak to me the things that I'm now speaking to other people, it would have saved me a lot of trouble in my adult life, uh, in my full adult life. So that's all I'll do and it is, um, and it's something I'm willing to do and I've started doing and I do it all the time. So, and I'm open to um, going to talk to boys because I know that's where the problem comes. And it is not good now, it's not going to go away in the next 20 years, uh, that apparent privilege of men. However, if the men are in positions, because it doesn't even have to be in a marriage, in, everywhere, if the, those men are men of dignity and character, then we have nothing to worry about. Like I told you, there's going to be, if Kamara is in a position where he can sign the appointment letter of a young, beautiful girl, is Kamara going to behave as somebody of character, or is he going to misuse that privilege? Now, that depends on if Kamara listened to Kableta when he was in secondary school. I'm joking, but you get my point. Um, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, I, I gave you an example that mm. even a man who violates the right of a woman, mm. if that woman was his sister, mm. he would say no. Mm. If that woman was his mother, he would say no. Mm. If that woman was his daughter, that would never happen. Mm. But why the wife, Joseph? Why not uh, protect the wife like you want to protect your mom, it's, your sister, it's, or your daughter? It's, um, it's a skewed, but, and by the way, of course, a few spill over, but I get your point. It's a skewed um, idea of what marriage is. And it all comes down to who that person is. Now, there will be people, even a tyrant is going to, um, even the worst tyrant in the world, there are going to be some people who are beyond his tyranny, who are protected. Okay, but everybody else out there is going to be, you know, um, receive, at the receiving end of that tyranny. So this person, for the, the mother, sister, daughter, will be protected. Uh, but if he's a tyrant, there's going to be somebody there who's going to suffer that tyranny. So the best thing we can do is teach him how not to be a tyrant. Teach him how to manage his anger, manage disappointment, manage positions of authority, because the chances that he's going to be there, and, and teach him how to manage the opposite sex because he's going to come in contact with them at some stage of his life. So, just because these people are spared, I mean, think of any tyrant you can think of in the world. Eh? Um, uh, even Shaka Zulu was, you know, killed. So, I mean, his mother was protected. But uh, nobody else was. Why? Because of his childhood, because of what he went through, because of those things. So, some of these, you know, um, uh, these people who are perpetrators of this violence were, first of all, victims, okay? And you have to turn that away because there's this man who saw his father doing something who perhaps was, you know, uh, mistreated in this way and all these things. So bef before somebody is a, in a villain, usually they are first a victim. So you have to arrest them between that place of being a victim before they become a villain and teach them that, okay, we know this happened in your past. It wasn't good. However, now you can stop that chain. You don't have to uh, inflict violence on your wife just because you saw your father doing it to your mother. Okay. You can stop that chain and be different because that is that that was it no more it was wrong so you can be the one who writes the wrong but also so beyond that mm, yeah schedule. beyond mm. reaching out to individual men mm. i think that a lot can be said about the creation of culture yeah as a society because we create our culture mm. yeah these things that we now call our culture did not happen overnight mm. the bagisu practiced imbalu for a very long time before it now became this culture that we uphold every day yeah mm. so we as a society can create a culture in which violence is not tolerated in which women are treated like human beings in which men are also allowed to exist as full human beings so we we cannot discount the value outside of individual interactions with individual abusers, of ourselves collectively as a society working on shifting, yeah, not just a mental shift, but also a shift in how we behave. It has to start from all of us. It really has to start from all of us. It can't be from the perspective of, okay, now one person is going to go and talk to these five men who have abused their wives. But these men are still going to go back into our society where if you don't beat your wife and she disrespects you, people, how can you allow this woman to talk to you like that? You understand? So at the end of the day, so society reinforces these things in the ways that we interact, in the things that we, we rebuke men for doing and the things that we don't rebuke men for doing. Right. So I just want to make the point of one of the solutions, one of the things that we can do towards curing this problem is actually the creation 
of a culture around the respect I, I for women. Know, I want to know, Tina, Tina, you. Tina, before you come in, Tina, mm -hmm. isn't the, the problem really on uh, economic, you know, uh, resources and, and an equal uh, power relation towards how you can manage those resources? If we put economic means in the hands of a woman, uh, resources, perhaps that could reduce uh, the, the, the friction that we see. So, again, several things need to happen. We need to go beyond the individual engagements because, as Godiva is saying, there's a lot of systems around every individual that is uh, maybe they're believing that they have privilege and everyone else thinks that's normal. Again, when we come to the economic issue and resources, it's still talking about power and control again because often someone who has resources is having more power than the one who doesn't have. Mm. The, then the, the gap becomes wider. So when we get back home, when I say home, it's not my home, but mm. everyone else, mm. we need to start valuing girls and boys equally. When we are giving inheritance, we must give our boys and our girls. We must give them equal opportunities in life. Let them both go to school. Let them both go to work and earn. Because just giving money to a woman is no solution. There is conflicting evidence around that. If her partner still believes that they must be the ones controlling, that money is going to cause her problems. He will beat the hell out of her and take away her money because he wants to subdue her because he is the man. He wears the pants in that relationship. So we need to transform both men and women and create a space. The, 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 okay. What, just what, just, what, what, just, just where I, I disagree with you mm -hmm. is culture is changed one person at a time. There is not going to be, um, when you change one, two, three, four, um, that's how culture is changed. If you wanted to change, uh, let's say, the, the, the national language in Uganda, you're not going to tell people now tomorrow speak Kiswahili. But if you make it compulsory in primary and what, over a period of time, they will start speaking Kiswahili. So what we are trying to do here is change culture. So we agree that culture needs to be changed. However, I'm saying... Culture it, is not static. It's, it's not static. Mm -hmm. However, we what I'm saying culture. is what we do by going and talking to those people, those people will be pos in MPs in positions of leadership and husbands and leaders and all those things. The time to talk to them is then. Now... What I'm saying here is, well, actually, mine is more practical, to be honest with you, because theirs is um, some kind of, you know, we need to change. But you but see, one person, person at a time. No, uh, okay. 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 One person at a time. Because Godiva, we have and evidence Tina. for what but let's, let's take a break. Yeah, when so we come back. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guests tonight are Godiva Akulo, Tina Musuya, and Joseph Kabuleta. And we're talking gender-based violence. How can it be stopped in our country? Tina, I've heard of cases that women who are emancipated, they are educated, they have money, or even they could be women activists. But them, them, they themselves are also in an abusive marriage. You know, you're even driving your 4x4. Four four. You have your shades, but those shades are actually you know, hiding scars of last night's abuse, and, and they keep there. Why? There are several reasons why some of those women keep there. One is um, some of them have been told, you know, when they are getting married, mm. they tell them that even the grave has transferred mm. to the other side. There is no space for them. So they should never shame the family to return. That's one. And then when they go to look for help, Somewhere they tell them, you know what, your mother even faced worse. I mean, a marriage is not a bed of roses. Hang in there because of your children. And then because they still fear, many women don't have that social status. People despise women who are not married. So some of them are fearing to be the mm -hmm. shameful women who are not married. So they hang in there because they want, uh, first of all, to be recognized as human beings because they are misses someone whether they are being beaten again and again, then others are still maybe trapped in that um, mm. abusive relationship because that's where her children are. That's where they, she has invested. You know, that's the mm. marital home. All her money is in there. Then it's so difficult for her to leave. 
And then if you look at the court process, maybe, it's so tedious. And often she may not be given a fair hearing mm. sometimes. And then, unfortunately, sometimes some religious leaders will tell them, when you are married, it is until death do you part. Mm. It is not accepted to divorce. And they tell her to hang in there until I don't know when. And then some people end up killing each other. So those are many reasons as to why they stay there. And because uh, they've been made to believe that marriage is a place to suffer. And they are prepared to endure. What, what's that song by Judy Guma. Marie? Maria Guma. Uh -huh. mm. Then there's uh, <laughs> that song. I don't remember who the singer was. Said Guma or singer Manja Bataya. So it's like a woman who has left an abusive relationship is this loose woman who you'd rather stay in there. But someone else said, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like once you're there, never leave. Stay in there. In fact, no I think the Honorable Judith Lavidi also sings a song advising women who have divorced that if you don't go back to uh -huh. the home, you're going to bury the children. You exactly. better you better go back mm -hmm. if you want your children alive. I think there's a song that was very popular. Mm -hmm. So but do you do we progressively are we making are we making progress in terms of creating awareness, Joseph? No, we are. We are definitely and these people have mentioned it and I am sure they are right um, have their finger right on the pulse because they are meeting women and trying to tell them some of these things. And, um, and, and uh, like, there has to be a bit, a bit, not like of women understanding what, they, that they can stand up to, you know, certain things. Because uh, in my experience, very few people have the character to handle um, somebody who just decides, you know. So you have to push a bit and, you know. Um, uh, yeah, but that said, um, uh, the reality is that the biggest problem here, and I'm speaking that as somebody who encounters these things, is that... 70% of women's problems are men, if I was to sum it up. So if we are going to actually get a solution, we have to teach men how to behave um, in like the way a proper man is supposed let, to behave. Let, let me try to involve some mm. Ugandans who have been mm. watching this uh, program from the very beginning. I have a call online and perhaps we'll get uh, different views. Hello. Hello. Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? I'm Mogok Morris calling from Chiwatule. Okay, you're on air, sir. Yes, so on the issue of women being equal to men, I disagree with Tina on whereby she said that also the girls should be given the, the inheritance. Why do you disagree? Okay. Just uh, he just stopped there. Mm -hmm. Let me let me pick another. Maybe Tina loves to respond. Let me pick another call online. Hello. Yes, please. This is Simon. Simon, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Amutungo. Um, I just wanted to say yes that that um, that I'm uh, that basically I've noticed there's a new generation gap in the discussion because I am 23 years old and we kids of the 90s generation actually celebrate women. I, I've been in schools where, for example, women have actually been empowered. But the biggest challenge that has not been addressed is that what happens when women are in power? Because it seems to me that women are starting to criticize men as if they are devils, but no one looks at it the other way around. Because I can give you a scenario like at school, once that uh, once when a man a, a young man slapped a fellow lady, the man was expelled immediately. But once a okay. young girl or the same age bracket abused uh, a man. It was, they were, it was forgiven and taken very lightly. Now, just like Mr. Kableka said earlier, men and women dif are differently. Now, women don't take physical abuse lightly. But however, men also don't take psychological abuse very lightly. So it has to be very differently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, but probably I'm going to take, pick two more calls and then we'll respond in the studio. I have a call online. Hello. 
Hello? Hello? Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Um, John Paul, I'm calling from Kampala. John Paul, you're on the air, sir. Thank you uh, for the show. Right. However, I note the following. Yes. That we don't need to repeat certain things. For example, we know that society has been disadvantaging women. Mm -hmm. We can go even to Saudi Arabia, other countries. Mm -hmm. That's not what we have to discuss about. We should be thinking of how do we help the society coming ahead and which are the driving forces. One of it is the family. Strengthen the family and create change there. And the other one is the church. I was disappointed when one of the panelists said, who brought religion? Because I think I've, as I grew up, I've been to church. They preach basically what brings peace, harmony, and, and that continuity. So I would think let's focus our strengths on institutions that can change the person who is born tomorrow. You may find the people, the people who are violating the rights of women are also actually uh, serious churchgoers. It is true, but I wanted to say that we belong, we, for us who are alive right now, we may have to accept that we already belong to a generation that has lost an opportunity. And we cannot keep lamenting within ourselves. Let's spend time on helping a generation coming ahead. Okay, that's why that woman is being told, stay in that marriage. Because if you ask, where is the site B? Where can she run to the U.S.? Because she has to complete her life. It's already a mistake in life. She will be told to see some bit of peace. Clean it there, but let's focus now on our children, which are the driving forces. Strengthen the family, strengthen the church. That's my submission. So we forget, we forget about the adult women. I mean, we have to appreciate that their, their generation is, is a bit unlucky. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone must be Okay, safe. thank you very much. Let me, let me uh, pick maybe the last call online. Uh, we have a call online. Hello? Hello? Hello. Yes, good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? Um, my name is Enoch. I'm calling from Otongo. Eh? Enoch, you're on air, sir. Yes, uh, regarding uh, the, the, the topic, mm -hmm. I don't agree with uh, the lady who the uh, team is saying mm. that a uh, lady should be inheriting because if it's a patriarchal society already, as you have mentioned, it means this lady married in another uh, clan, and meaning if she inherits the father's richness, she's taking the business of the empire to another clan. So if it's a patriarchal society and you look at inheritance, you have to address it all around. Otherwise, the person who is protecting his empire is looking at pushing his empire to another clan of someone who is not worth it. So if you understand what I mean, because someone married in the other clan. Okay. So inheritance is not... You, you, you've, you've made your point, sir. I, I, uh, well, quite a number of people are trying to make a contribution, and uh, uh, so many online. I'm tempted to pick another call online. Uh, hello? 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 Yes, we have a lady. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, what's your name, ma'am, and where are you calling from? My name is Francis Sheila. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Yes, um, let me give you a, please, do not listen to the echo, don't mind about, just make your statement in one go, don't mind about the echo that is repeating and you're hearing in, in your ear, right. because you have left the TV on, so it, we can't have a healthy conversation unless the, the volume of your TV is turned down. So do not mind okay. about the echo, just keep going. Okay, my name is Fancy Sheila Aromarach, from uh, Lira. Oh no. Okay. I could not have that conversation with Sheila in Lira. Hello? Yes, hello. 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 You're on air. Yes. What's your name uh, and where are you calling uh, from? My name is Barbara. Barbara, you're on air. My name is Barbara Nakayenzo and um, I'm interested in calling from Bogolori. Okay. My name is Barbara Nakayenzo and I'm calling from Bogolori. Barbara, you're on air. Yes, I'm interested in. Uh, in, uh, I'm more interested in women and men working together to curb violence against women. I like the fact that you've been able to bring uh, Joseph Kabuleta, and I, I would like that we stop looking at it from an argumentative point of view. Other, as, rather, we should work together as women and men, because I see very good uh, 
very good speakers right there. So what, how about we work together as a team to curb violence against women in the country? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I may not be able to pick any more callers. So, yes, uh, maybe you go for, a, there was a question for you, actually two questions, people who disagreed with you, Tim. Uh -huh. So I would like to let <laughs> everyone else out there know that the standard should be we are all humans. Men, women, we are all humans. And therefore, we need to be having the same privileges and same opportunities. Wouldn't you really feel good if your mother also had an inheritance to pass over to you as their child? And we need to come away from this um, um, thinking that when a woman gets married to this family, she has gone. Who tells you she has gone? She's still with you. And those children are also your relatives. So they need to benefit from what she has. And I'm sure that would be a good thing if I was a man, for example, I would be happy to marry a woman who is also bringing something for the good of our family. So for me, I think, and I believe very much that women and boys, I mean girls and boys, should both inherit from their parents. I think that's the starting point of fairness and bridging the gender inequality gap. Okay. Um, well, our time is out, but mm -hmm. let me ask each one of you to give us your concluding remark, beginning with you, Joseph. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad that we're having the discussion like this after uh, a member of parliament said those things. I think that is a sign after of progress. After he had apologized at least. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, the <laughs> fact that he was even forced to apologize um, is, is, is the fact that there is some progress uh, in all these things. And uh, it's good. Uh, just to answer some of what some of those people are saying, um, well, um, I, would, I would give my daughter <laughs> an inheritance. And there are cases, uh, there are clear cases in the Bible where that happened. And um, uh, the Bible says, righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children. It doesn't say for his married children. So um, that thing is cultural and it is not right. Now for me, I follow a different standard. So my daughter will get uh, inheritance because there will be inheritance. Um, that's, but, but all said, uh, we have to understand one thing, that the privilege of men is going to continue as long as probably we are all alive. So the best thing we can do in the circumstances is to teach them how to protect the women. And also the fact that women are, um, you, know, uh, the, the, you know, the weaker vessel, and by vessel it means vessel, vessel. You see, that's what the Bible calls them. You, I don't, you don't have to agree with me. But the reality is that in war, women and children are given special protection. Now, if you kill women and children, it is treated as doubly bad to killing men. Why? Because they are seen as people deserving of protection. Okay? And that's even in Western societies, which so many of us want to copy. So why are women and children ganged together in war? Because they are seen as people who need to be protected. And that's not a bad thing. And that's not a thing of putting them down or dehumanizing them. It's actually a thing of appreciating their specialness. Okay, now... When it says weaker vessels, by vessel it means the body, okay? And, um, and, and th th that's who they are, and, but it says we are joint heirs, joint, okay? Heirs of what God has given us. So these things, if people understood what really the Bible says about relationships, it is the best book for it, for relationships, because it is the manufacturer's manual. He made man, made woman, and he has the best answer for how these two people can live together if people understood. But of course, so many people get it wrong and run off with the wrong. And they think the Bible is patriarchal. It isn't. It is not. Okay? The Bible caters so much for women, as much, perhaps even more than for men. So, you know, when you say the, 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 the patriarchs like the, the, the King Solomon and, uh, and, and, and King David and all this and what they did, mm. uh, you wonder if the... No, we're actually talking about, um, uh, you see, because the Bible is divided, because there was that, there was that culture of that time. Yeah. But there is the New Testament culture in Jesus, which we believe in, okay, which is kind of different. Now, but all said, we can change the men and teach men how to be honorable. And you see, that's my passion. It's not just something I'm saying here on TV. It's something I do. I've said on NTV in different areas, different uh, shows here on NTV. My passion is to teach the young men that you can behave differently. Because some of them come from abusive homes, they have seen these things, they have seen the polygamy, they have seen all those things. So they just, that is their normal. So when they get into a relationship, it is defined by what they have seen. You can only ever tell somebody to do what they have seen. So if you teach him that, no, 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 if your father did it, and your grandfather did it, you don't have to do it. Because this is a different generation. And that gentleman said there is a generational gap. Now that's the, the younger generation, 
the 23 is the millennials are the ones I'm interested in because they're impressionable and we teach them how to be honorable. Now when we do, every man that you teach how to be a person of character, you've saved a woman at a later stage in their life. So that's my role. Thank you. Godva, your parting. Mm, yes, in parting, I want to agree with one of the callers who mm. called in and said that we need to strengthen the family mm. and strengthen, he said strengthen the church. And I think that we've been making the presumption in this conversation we've been having mm. that everybody is a Christian. Yeah, mm. In this country alone, the people who practice Islam, the people who are Hindus, you mm. understand? Mm. So we can't continue to think that we can prescribe this one small thing. Yeah? So if we're saying change the church, let's say change religious institutions, strengthen religious institutions, because those are places where people go for spiritual nourishment and therefore spaces where I think that they would be open yeah, to being influenced and to growth. But now strengthening the family, I, I want to say two specific things about st strengthening the family. First of all, we have to strengthen the family in terms of how we conduct marriage rights. Yeah? But we also have to strengthen the family in terms of how we listen to women. Yeah, listen to women. When women say they're in pain, let's listen to them. When women say that a problem has been going on for this long, let's listen to them. We need to create a society that listens to women more so that we can start to take women more seriously. Okay. Yeah? Tina. In everything, yeah. You're parting short. Yes. So uh, for me, I think several things that I'll say to close. Um, one. Everyone out there needs to know that all men out there are responsible. They also have a responsibility to do many things to change the status quo. They can do it. And once they make um, relationships more equitable and even condemn all forms of violence that are happening within the community, it's to the benefit of men and to the women and children. And every action that one person takes to break the tolerance to violence, you know, every time you keep quiet and uh, even justify that violence, you're also a perpetrator. That's what you should know. What you have to do is condemn the act and even help that person who has been abused to speak out. For me, I think that's my closing remark. Thank you very much. Joseph Cavaleta, thank you very much. Godiva, thank you very much, uh, Tina. And uh, this brings us to the end. Uh, maybe I, I read, I think it was a Ghanaian scholar who said, if you educate a man, you'll have educated an individual. If you educate a woman, you'll have educated a nation. So I think if we educate our, our girls and give them empowerment, I think they're going to raise families that are better, that maybe can withstand some of these shocks. And probably they can teach and groom the families to come and eventually that those vices will be wiped out. Thank you, Uganda. Good night and God bless.